What's the matter with you, PPPP? Hey, what's up? I'm back. It's like I was just up here. Wow. Wow. Well, um, I would just like to um, start off by just saying this is a cool series. Fear is, is a fun subject to talk about. You could turn me down a little bit or something's weird. I don't know what it is. Um, I, I think it's so cool to talk about fear because um, it's everywhere. It's in our lives. Uh, anybody experienced fear this last week? A few people experienced fear. Everybody else is perfect. This is great. It's going to go well today. Uh, I, I just notice it. It's all around us. It's all the time. And uh, I think for, for us here in this church, like, we are a missile that is going after the king, after God. We, we're a missile. And anything that, that people fear, that, like, we're, bring, it, bring us to it. We're ready for it. And so um, I want to read a quote that's, that's there. You can turn me up a little bit now. I don't know. I'm, I'm just behind these speakers, but... Um, it says this, when men don't fear God, they give themselves to evil, Ray Comfort. Good old Ray Comfort. When men don't fear God, they give themselves to evil. I, I got this awesome story. How many of you guys have watched the movie, M Moby Dick movie? Anybody? <laughs> wow, that's a few people. Okay, it's based on this, this boat called the Essex. And the Essex was a ship, a whaling ship that went out... Um, because of whaling was depleted, they had to go pretty far away, and it got hit by a, a sperm whale, and it, it was a pretty shady boat to begin with, so it started to sink, and these guys had, while the boat was sinking, a choice to make. Are they going to go to this, this place called uh, Marques or something like that, or they, they could go, which was like 1,200 miles, or they could go 3,000 miles to this other destination. Well, they didn't want to go 1,200 miles because there could be cannibals on the island. So they went 3,000 miles. I mean, they attempted 3,000 miles because of fear of cannibals, not their own personal death. And so here's a group of guys. Their ship sinks. They're in these little whaling boats, and they're out. And they get some guys ended up dying. They... Um, it's a crazy story, but what's, what ends up happening is this one boat ends up getting separated from the rest, and these guys end up drawing lots to see who they're going to eat, and they end up eating two guys on the ship. So what they feared ultimately became what they became. They became cannibals, and these guys survived and, um, and, and lived on to tell this, this tale, and I, I, I just think of how ridiculous our fears can be. Our fears can tell us what to do and how to live. Anybody else in with me on that? Yeah. And so I have a, a quote for you. Here's a quote. It says, whatever you fear is God. Look at your neighbor. Whatever you fear is God. Whatever you fear is God. It's just the truth. Whatever you fear it speaks to you. It, it, it tells you what to do. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think what's so hard about the subject I'm about to talk to you about is that it's very rare to hear in the church. Not only that, it's a foundation of who we are. Not only that, um, fear, the, the subject that I'm going to talk to you about, I think is something that first makes us go, what? What? And, and, and I guess what I want to talk to you guys about is the fear of God today. The fear of God. In fact, I sat with so many older men that have read the Bible. I've sat with all sorts of people. And I sit down and I'm like, I'm doing the fear of God. I need you to give me some thoughts. And I've had everything thrown at me like, it's the reverence of God. Have you heard this? I think they're right. Have you ever been in reverence of God where you're like, you're the, you're the kind of the one that needs to catch up to who God is? I mean, it's the, but it's just the reverence. It's he's father. He's awesome. But then how about this? It's not fear. It's awe of God. It's you're in awe of God. Anybody been like 
you know, you just look at God and you go, wow, look how big he is. Look how awesome he is. Um, but I, I, I want to tell you today that I will not preach that. And I know that that's what a lot of people believe, and they'll preach that the fear of God is just awe and reverence. But the truth is, in the Bible, it's not. The truth is, people get freaked out by God. And the fear of God actually means the fear of God. Is that shocking? I, I really dove into this, but I, I want to start off with Proverbs 1.7. And if you believe it's just the reverence and the awe, then it's a totally different thing that we're reading here. But it says this, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. How about this? The beginning of wisdom. That's what one version says. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fear of God is the beginning. It's the foundation of wisdom. It's the foundation of everything. And so, okay, if it's that important, why do we not talk about it? Because the truth is, we like grace. Anybody else in here like grace? Yeah. Woo, it's awesome. He forgives you. You're all good, man. Now you can go and have six other wives. He doesn't care. He'll forgive you. It's grace. Which is very true in a weird way. I mean, God is very graceful. He is awesome. But there's more to it than that. It's not just a bunch of fluff. It's not just a bunch, oh, I'm just in love. Everything's just great. I mean, my life is falling apart. I'll just be honest with you. Last night, I, I preached this whole message. I get home. Uh, 1130 at night, I get a phone call from the sheriff's department. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what, what family this is, and please don't ask me, but I got called because a man was dead, and someone that went to our church showed up at their, at their house to go home, and their, 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 their husband was dead in the car, and they had to do CPR on a man that was dead that was their, <laughs> their, their family. And I pulled up, and he's on the ground there, and I talked to the family, and they're just in shock. And I just think, okay, the fear of God. What do you think this man is feeling right now? It's over. It's done. Like, you think it's awe. Oh, it's awe and reverence. I think it's, oh, shoot. I got my life, and he's a perfect God that can't wink at sin. I mean, if God could wink at sin, he wouldn't be perfect. But he can't wink at sin. He doesn't wink at sin. He's just perfect. And so this man gets to experience God. And I think, I think for us, fear of God is so key. When I was, a, when I was younger, um, going to Bible college, I... I I just had a hard time in school just sitting and listening. And so I, the only way I could do it was to dream about kayaking, and then I'd go kayaking during, you know, two or three times a week and risk my life just so I could feel like a human. And um, my, my friend was a whitewater, uh, he was a professional kayaker, and he dropped off waterfalls. His name is Josh Bechtel, and he came over, and he's an amazing guy. Twitch videos, he's in al almost every one of them, and they're from the Northwest, and and uh, anyways, he, I had a chance to become a professional whitewater kayaker, and they invited me to this Arkansas River in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I took a left instead of a right, so I ended up showing up four hours late <laughs> because I had to turn around and come back at two hours the wrong direction in Colorado. You don't even know. You know, it's just nowhere there. And so I come back. And it's just getting dark, and the river's in flood stage, and the, these guys all have Tiva vans. They're all sponsored, and they get out, and they're like, hey, oh, shoot, we're just loading up. And they say, you want to go? And I wanted to prove myself to them because I'd rather be a professional kayaker than a pastor. And so um, it just sounded better. And so I said, I want to go. I want to do this. And they're like, sweet, man. We'll do it again. And, and so I get in my kayak, and, they, and in this section's called Numbers because there's so many rapids. They're just one, two, three, four. And so I get in the kayak, and the guy said, don't hit number four. It'll kill you. It's really bad right now. And the river's black, and there's stuff floating down it. And so I get in. I'm doing awesome. I'm, doing, I'm showing these guys this is my next career. And then I make it around number four, and then it surfs me back in, and I got tumbled in a washing machine. And, and I'm in this washing machine, and they, they tell you never pull out of a kayak 
and, but I couldn't get air. I couldn't breathe. And I thought, this is how it's going to end. And I thought, my like, I don't know how you can think so much in a short period of time. I thought of my kids, and I thought of my family, and I thought, there's no way I'm going to drown in this thing. But I could not get up. And, and the, I did the one thing that, that you should never do, but I felt like there's a voice in my head saying, you need to pull out of this kayak. But it's a giant flotation device, so it's a really dumb choice. But I pulled out of the kayak, and I, I felt another voice kind of say, just make yourself big. I don't even, I'm not even that smart. I just, I <laughs> knew what to do. I made myself big, and somehow it blew me out. And then I was going down this, this river in flood stage, freezing cold. And I'm hitting my legs on rocks, and there's a log jam. And you're not supposed to go towards log jams, but I didn't have a choice. And I got shoved up on a log jam, and then I climbed up on the log jam, and I'm bleeding, and I'm freezing. And I look over, and they're terrified. I'm terrified, and I felt like God started speaking to me at that moment. Is this what you want to do with your life? Is this who you are? Is this who you want to be? I'm standing there, blood coming down. They're like, you got to jump back in. I'm like, get the fire department. They're like, we're in Colorado. There is no fire department three hours from any town. You got to jump back in. And I just sat there and I just said, God, save me. I'm terrified. I'm terrified that you could take me right now. I'm terrified that this is how my life could end. You know, that, that was kind of a moment, and I drove home for a couple of hours just sitting there thanking God um, with my leg. I had a big hole in my leg, and I, I, I feared God. I want to say this. When you're reading this Bible, you'll notice that men all over the place feared God like crazy. And I also want to say this before we dive into this thing fully is you can't pair fear without love. We talked about last week, fear and love go together. It's not just the fear of God, but the fear of God leads into the love of God. But without the fear of God, you have something that's missing. And, and, uh, and so I got some uh, four men that feared God, and I just picked some random stories. Uh, there's every, one, every one of them, you have this wild uh, situation. But let me tell you the first one, Elijah. I love Elijah because... He's, he's this crazy prophet that after fire falls from heaven, he's freaking out and he's afraid of a woman. But anyways, <laughs> um, he can handle 400 prophets or whatever, but he can't handle one angry lady. But um, he, he's sitting there on a hill, and they're, they're saying they're, these guys are cutting themselves and chanting, fire come down, our gods are real. And, and Elijah looks at him and says, maybe your gods urinating somewhere so I go in the bathroom you know he's just messing with him he's like okay I'm gonna pray watch what happens fire's gonna come down and this and and, it, and it, go ahead and make it wet and fire comes down lights this altar up and then and, and our God is proven and it says this in first Kings 18 38 and 39 it says immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull um, the wood, the stones, and the dust. Like the stones and the dust. I mean, this is a big deal. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground f and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. What brought them to that place where they're like, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. It freaked them out. They saw the power of of God, which is, I've never seen rocks, like, completely burned up. That's insane. And, 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 and because of this fear, it brought them to the realization that our God is God. I, I love this. I, I love that, that story. How about this Isaiah? Isaiah has this encounter with God where these angels come and they shake the foundations of the church that he's in. They shake the ground and they, they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. And Isaiah is, is not like, oh, awe and reverence. He's freaking out and he actually says, oh my gosh, I am doomed. I'm a mess. I'm a loser before this amazing God. And, and, and then the smoke comes. And then an angel grabs a coal, and he says, I'm a liar. And an angel grabs a coal and touches it to his lips. And this 
fear of God turns into the awe and reverence of God. Because the coal is the forgiveness of his life and the purification of his life. And, and then Isaiah gets to say, hey, I met God face to face, and yet he didn't kill me. In fact, he's wonderful. It goes on. Isaiah 8.13 says this. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the only one you should fear. He is the only, he is the one um, who you should make, who should make you tremble. Who else? Uh, trembling kind of sounds like you're freaked out. He's the only one that should make you fear or f- anything. Because he's so wonderful and he's so big and he's so awesome. How about this? The disciples. T- it says, uh, Luke 8, 25, Jesus calms the storm, and just like, boom, storm just goes, bam, it's calm waters. And it says this, then they asked him, where, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other, when he gives a command, even the wind and waves obey him. You know what I mean? It's like that moment when you realize God is actually God. You know what I'm talking about? The beginning and the end. He was the first. He was here before us. And he will be here at the end. He is everything. He created everything. He, he is God. How, how about this? Um, how about this? Luke uh, 23, 39. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Which says a lot more about us, a lot about us as well as about God, but it says how messed up we are. That God would have to send Jesus to die on a cross. Like, just think about the the perfect, holy, amazing God of the universe, and he has to die on the cross for you. Like, it it says uh, how amazing his love is, but it also says, are you going to stand before God and be like, hey, I'm good, man. When Jesus had to die on the cross for your life, because of the things that you did? And, and Jesus is up on the cross, and these two criminals are having a conversation. Check this out. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the me- Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're, you're at it. That's awesome. Like it, it, it might work out, actually, for him. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man wasn't done. uh, This man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't it weird that fear is even mentioned on the cross and the criminals hanging there going, dude, we're guilty. And he's not. Like, that's just amazing on its own. And he says, but hey, don't you even fear God when you're guilty like this and the lights are out and all of a sudden it's just you and the dumb things that you've done? I, I'll tell you what, my parents, my parents are awesome. I love my parents. But did you know I didn't do some dumb things because they had consequences for those things? I mean, I I would love to have done them. I would have loved to. But the consequence, I feared my dad. I feared what would happen. Guess what? My dad loves me. I genuinely feared my dad. Have you noticed in our culture a lack of fear for authority, let alone a fear for God? Parents are like uh, homeboys with their children, and they don't want to punish them, yet the last... 2,000 years, that's how it was, and then all of a sudden, it's like we're homeboys with our kids, and, 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 and they don't fear anything, <laughs> and that's not in my notes, so erase that from your brain, um, but I just think it's interesting that when you see God for who God is, it changes how you live your life. You could call it awe and reverence, but there's also the fear of discipline. 
Because if the Bible says that if he loves you, he'll discipline you. If you love him, he will discipline you because he loves you. But discipline's not something that's super exciting to even talk about. Um, I, I, I even p- I put some of these things in here just because I thought, it, here are some things that we should do because we fear God. And I want these things to just stick in your mind. Remember, we're just talking about the fear of God, and this is a shotgun, and this subject we can talk for months about. But, but here are some things that we need to do because we fear God. Here's the first one, 2 Corinthians 5.11. It says this, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. You know what Paul says? Because we're freaked out, we're afraid by the Lord. I mean, we we have this fear of the Lord. We tell others about Jesus. Is this your life? Do you tell others about Jesus? Or are you actually not afraid about of God, period, and you're really a people pleaser and afraid of people this should make most of us go dang it i'm a pastor and i have this issue isn't that weird that we put people before the god of the universe the first and the last he sends fire down Um, it, it could get crazy i mean let's just be honest it's nuts do we share the love of god and what he's done in our lives because we fear him or do you actually are you playing a game with your faith and you're saying one thing but you're living another life you know hell is full of of religious people in fact the majority of people in hell will be religious bible says that people that don't know god never heard of god whatever we don't even have to worry about them god will (laughs) it'll be great for them i'm sure and for us that do know god but don't follow god don't live for god huh I, I think there's a genuine fear that needs to take place in our life, uh, but it's followed with love. I, I think we need to share with others. And I think when I say this, I know you know who, you're t- who I'm talking about. I think there's some people in your life. I think you need to stop being so afraid. God is he's so wonderful. And if he hasn't changed your life like he has changed mine, Maybe you need to go after him today. I mean, find yourself at the altar right after this. Just run up here, fall on your face before God and say, I want something real. I don't need some plastic religion. How about this? Worship, 2 Samuel 6, 14 and 15. This is my favorite. I should have just picked this whole verse and spoke the whole message on. Uzzah, this guy, um, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's presence. And Uzzah uh, is walking next to the Ark and the oxen kind of stumble, and the ark starts to look like it's going to fall. And Uzzah said, I, the, the, the presence of the Lord is not going to fall. And Uzzah puts his hand out to stop the ark from falling, and God kills him dead. Which is saying, you're not going to catch God, because he doesn't need to be caught. He is perfect. He is God. <laughs> this makes David so mad, because he's a great guy. He was a great guy. But guess what? God chose to kill Uzzah. And so David fears the Lord. David fears the Lord. Uh, 2 Samuel 6.12 says David fears the Lord. I mean, he is afraid of the Lord because of what happened. And so David decides that he was, this is David's like becoming king situation. So David decides instead of letting the presence of the Lord come to his house and his town, let's let it go to this other Odebed guy's house. And to let him have the presence of the Lord because he could kill some people. Right? Like the presence of the Lord is so awesome, but you can have him for right now. I'm the king of Israel. We'll stay over here. And guess what? We find we find that this Odebed guy, or whatever his name is, he gets blessed beyond reason. And word gets back to David that God has been blessing this man. And so because of this overwhelming blessing that God has poured, David goes and gets the Ark of the Covenant and brings the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. But David is so broken because of his fear of God with the fact that we need God in our life because God is the source of blessing. God is the source of our security and safety. And so David just as the ark is coming into the city, just strips his clothes off and just dances like 
a Pentecostal <laughs> with flags and craziness. <laughs> Woo! He's, he's like, close off. He doesn't care because he is so sorry that the fear of God just ended there but wasn't followed with, but, I'm, but I need you. But you see, it took that for David to realize how much he needed God. You got it? And so, but meanwhile, his wife is in town, Saul's daughter, and Saul's daughter goes, look at you, you idiot. You're dancing like a fool. People aren't going to follow your leadership. And David goes, I could dance even weirder. I'm not afraid of anybody, and this is not going to affect my, because he knows God is God. And there is no other God. And God is God in his life. And it started with the fear of God and the power of God. But it ended with the fact that he is going to bless us even though he's like this. Uh, I think this is, this is really important for us. How about this? Let's just bring up a subject that makes everybody mad. Tithe. <laughs> Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 23. And I know there are people that say, I don't believe in a tithe. You know what? They've always tithed. Tithe has always been a part of the church. The problem is people are afraid of committing. And so they don't commit anywhere. And the other thing is people are afraid of controlling stuff. But check this out. Tithe. I'm just going to bring this up, and I'm not saying this. Tithe somewhere else if you don't want to tithe to our church. But it says it's Deuteronomy 14.22. You must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. A tenth, this is just what you do. In fact, we find at the beginning of the Bible with Cain and Abel is, is giving the first of what you have to God. And it's not controlling it. It's just letting it go. It's just giving it to him and saying, I trust you in this. It's not about me. It's about you. And I'm putting you first in my life. And it goes on at the very end, and it says this. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. But the problem is our culture doesn't want to fear God. We want to control God because we can, right? And so we... We, we withhold, we do th these certain things because we think actually that we can do it, what we want. And in the process, instead of fearing God, we fear not having things. We fear being, with, you know, like, contr like controlling stuff. It says here, it says this in Proverbs 15, 16, it's pretty clear. Better to have a little with the fear of the Lord than to have great treasure and inner turmoil. Oh, I, I want this to be my life. I want someday for someone to look at me and say, you know, he didn't have much, but he had everything. You know what? Every time we get stuff, I feel like God, and my wife will say this, I feel like God just says we need to give it away. I have a boat burning a hole in my garage because I just feel like God keeps saying this is something you could give away. And I know this is the heart of our church and people in our church. And uh, I, I love this. It's better to have the fear of the Lord and little than to have the responsibility of having a lot and then saying, I'm going to hold it for myself and be in inner turmoil, knowing that God has made you like what my grandpa would say. I, Kellogg's are good at making money, but it's because we give it away and we build the kingdom. But to have inner turmoil to say, but I'm holding it for myself. And God says, I'm the one that gave you that blessing. And the day that your last breath happens and you're laying in the driveway and you're having a conversation with God, God's sitting there going, really? Really? But it's hard when you don't see God as God. I'll have my piano player come up. I wanted to finish with this uh, last one. Listen. When we fear God, we hear God. Psalms 25, 14. The Lord is a friend of those who fear him. <laughs> who else is he a friend with? It starts with the fear. The fear is the starting of wisdom. The Lord is a friend of those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. When you hear God, when you fear God, you hear God. When you fear God, he teaches you. When you don't fear God, you teach you. You tell yourself what to do. You let your stuff tell you how to live your life. You don't live the way Jesus did, walking around blessing people, walking around opening your heart up, and they were hurting him. And there he said, I don't care. I'm not afraid of you. I'm afraid of God. 
If you only knew who he was, this wouldn't even be a big deal to you. I love that. I love that when you fear God, you hear God. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8 (laughs) says this. This is what the Lord says, Israel, King and Redeemer. The Lord of the heaven's armies, I am the first and the last. There is no other God. I want to say this to you. There is no other God. You're not God. There is no other God. But I want you to hear what God is saying to you. There is no other God, people. I am the Lord, your God. There is no other God. Go on. It says, who is like me? Who is like me? Now look in the Bible. And you can honestly say no one. No one in history, no, I always make fun of Buddha just because the weirdest statues ever. But, like, no one is like God. I mean, some guys say some nice things, but God has a history of being graceful and merciful, even though he should have smoked us from Adam and Eve, right? When I came into the world, it should have been over right there, but he loves us. And the powerful amazing God. No one's like him. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. God said, hey, if there's another God, stand up. Prove himself. (laughs) It's going to be funny. It's going to be like Elijah. Let him do as I have done since ancient times. Let him do it. And it says this, when I establish a people and explain its future, when I establish the people and explain its future, no one's like our God. No one's as big as our God. No one can do what our God can do. There is no other God. He's the beginning and the end. I mean, you just, if you let this start to become your life, everything else in your life will be infected. It'll be infiltrated. When you sit in moments in your house and go, you kind of freak me out, but more so because of who I am, not because of who you are. And I love this. After saying how wonderful he is, he says this, do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? Are you my witnesses? Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. You know what God says? When you get the vastness of who I am, you're going to go, Wah! And then God says, don't be afraid. If you really did know me, you wouldn't be afraid. At first you might, but then you're going to want me in your house, and you're going to want me in your job, and you're going to want me in your finances, and you're going to want me in your parenting skills, and you're going to want me in your friendships, and you're just going to want me even when no one's around, you're going to want me. I mean, this is just who I am, but it starts with, that's who you are. Oh, this is who you are. It's fear and love. It goes together. I have a, I have an example I want to show you. Uh, it's B-roll. These little girls said they wanted to play soccer against their parents. And so I actually asked one of the parents, I said, are we going to let the little guys win? And the mom goes, no. Really? Like we can just unleash on them? My wife said, don't share that, but I'm going to share it. I think think it's awesome. These little girls got together. They're all huddled up like, yay, we're going to beat the parents. It's going to be so cool. But here's the problem. Us fat old parents, not everyone's fat on this, but we're not as athletic as these kids. I'll tell you that. The problem is we're big. Size matters. We destroyed these kids. They started off like, oh, you guys are going to end by the end. They're like... And I think we built them up. Don't worry. We let them sc- score a few goals because everybody gets a trophy. But you know what these kids learn? To fear us. Not in a bad way. We love them. No one loves them more than we do. No one loves you more than God does. But when you want to pair your, oh, God, I got my finances. Oh, God, I got my family. I got every. We got it all. <laughs> And then God sits there like, you want to, oh, I guess another God is standing up to prove himself. And then God steps in with discipline and he wakes you up. 
I'll tell you, last night was a wake-up call, and I'm sorry for going to the lake, but I want to say this. If you're here and you struggle with an alcohol addiction, stop. You know how hard it is to sit and look in a kid's eyes who tried to pump the chest of a dead dad while puke is everywhere, and he's sitting there going, why? What did I do? And they'll look in this kid and say, you know, you matter. The way your dad lived isn't exactly the truth of how amazing you are. If you're my son, I'd be so happy for you to be my son, but I'm sorry your dad treated you like this. You're not worth that. You're worth this. If you just knew. I see a man who ran from his problems and never solved them and found alcohol as a temporary solution that ultimately was to his demise. And do you know the parents here, some parents sit there and go, I think I'm having an affair on somebody. And we, we don't talk about this in church a lot, but people will have an affair on their wife. You know how awful it is when you have to get the two together and the little kids are sitting there like, Dad chose somebody else. You see, God has a plan, but it's because He loves you. It should freak you out because it's better than you. One, one, one day, I just, whatever you fear is your God. What do you fear? Do you really, truly fear God? Or are you like those little kids? I got this. I, I, there's a quote by Oswald Chambers. Most people can't understand his stuff, but I love it. And it says this, the, rem the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear n everything else. Everything else. You know what's wrong with America? You know what's wrong with the church? No one has a tattoo on their arm that says, any fear God verses, they're all, Jesus died for me. It's grace. It's love. But Man, it starts with the fear of God. Your marriage needs the fear of God. Everything in your life needs the fear of God. I'm just going to pray. And by the way, Benjamin Franklin says, fear God and your enemies will fear you. <laughs> Father, we thank you. How big you are. I can, I, can, I can stand on this stage and I can't tell you, I can't, can't put out there how many amazing moments in my life where I just fall on my knees and I think you're that wonderful and how many moments in my life I've fallen down going I'm a fool before you I'm doomed there's nothing that can happen with these bones and then you grab me up and say it starts here Daniel but you need me thank you God thank you God that you're fear that you're so big that in fear God you don't hate us, you love us, and you have a history, and no one else in this world has the history like you. So God, right now, I just pray. I just pray someone's heart falls before you right now, God. I pray someone reconsider some things in their life right now. I pray, God, that we live the, the life that when we stand before you, you say, well done, good and faithful servant not that's what you did with it I love you Father thank you in your name we pray Amen we're going to continue we're going to take communion so I'm going to have the communion being passed while I'd like to share what Daniel what was spoken loud and clear to me from Daniel's message when Daniel was talking about the fear of God what God spoke to me was the fear of God means that God knows everything. God is everything. And God is everywhere. He alone has the power to put man in hell. He alone has the power to take our life right now. But instead of that, the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world... The world that did not want him, that he gave his one and only son. And what I love about the fear of God is, if we look at the cross, that was why Jesus was put on the cross. God is holy. He does not wink at sin. God does not tolerate sin. 
Because if he tolerated sin, he would not have sent his son. If there was another way, he would have given that way. But God does not like sin. So he made a way. The Bible said he sent his son. When Jesus was put on the cross, every nail, seven times to complete, his hands were nailed to the cross. His feet was nailed to the cross. They put a crown on his head. He was flawed. Isaiah said that he was unrecognizable. If there was another way, God would have done it. And the cross is his love. The cross is the way. We might say, oh no, we can't defeat sin. There's no excuse. He already defeated it. The devil does not have power over you because Jesus' spirit lives in us. I love what Daniel was saying. That the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. The fear of God builds us up. It doesn't tear us down. The fear of God draws us to the love of God. But it must begin with the fear of God. There's nothing to fear. Because in the fear of God is the love of God. And so today we're going to take communion to remember and thank God for what he has done. After the service last night, somebody asked me, how does the fear of God look to you? And I love the way Daniel says about friendship. God sometimes will share something with me that, that grieves his heart. And when he tells me how much it hurts him, I realize I can't do it any longer. So whenever I am I'm tempted to do that, I love him so much that I don't want to hurt him or grieve him. And the fear of God, my response is, help me, Lord, so I don't keep doing what hurts you. And I think that God is calling the church right now to be holy as he is holy. Let's stand up. On the night that Jesus Christ was with his disciples they came together he washed their feet and he wanted to show them that he was giving them a new covenant a covenant that means we don't we no longer need to live in sin we no longer need to run from people that there's only one to fear is him but in, in fearing him is his love so in first Corinthians he broke bread and he said in verse 24, and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. I am going to not just say take it. I'm going to ask you right now. If God was sitting here right now, what would you tell him about what he did? And I'm going to give you time to thank him personally saving our life and I'm going to have you talk to God right now what would you say to Jesus for what he has done for us you can talk to him he is here the Bible says when two or more are gathered in his name he is here what would you tell Jesus Thank you, Lord, that you made a way for us. Even though we didn't want you, even now, some of us, we live our lives without you. We claim that we are Christians. We claim that we know you. But sometimes we just walk away. Sometimes we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power of knowing you. We want to say thank you that you could have in your wrath 
just taking us out but you chose to make a way where there was no way you chose to give your son as a ransom for our sin thank you Jesus you didn't have to do this but the Bible says for the joy that was set before you you endured the cross and I think the joy is in this room right now many that will call on the name of Jesus many that will know the Father so as we take this bread together Lord we proclaim that Lord we love you we don't deserve this but we love you because you first loved us and we say thank you in Jesus name amen you can take it the next verse in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this to remember as often as you drink it what are we to remember in the book of Leviticus it said the life is in the blood and God is saying there's a new covenant for us in the blood of his son we have a new life there's now no condemnation to those who believe in Christ the message today was not to condemn. The message was to invite you to an awesome, relentless love of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that as you do this, you remember what he did for us. So I'm going to ask you again to thank him personally. Tell him how grateful you are that he gave his life, that he shed his blood on the cross. on the cross for loving us so much but we remember this that it's not by our might or power but it's by your Holy Spirit all I can see is your hands held out and saying come come my children I've made a way but we remember this as a church today that you love us so much and there are many people out there in our lives they feel hopeless but I use us to tell them there is a savior that loves them so much but he didn't just say he loves you he laid down his life to prove to you that he loves you so father as we remember this we say thank you thank you so much Jesus and we celebrate that we have a new covenant because of your love in Jesus name amen you may take it every time we take communion I don't know why I cry but it's not a sad thing it's actually a celebration it's actually a reminder to the enemy that you see God is crazy in love with his children and I want to say this to you. We're not going out mourning. We are going to celebrate that Jesus has won the victory. And I just want to say before we enter worship, let's just go crazy. We're thanking God in a loud voice. Let's just begin to clap. Let's just begin to call on the name of Jesus because he has won. He has won. He loves you. He cares for you. Let's do this song.